Hello and welcome back to this downfall idealistic crusade. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about Shaft. Okay, that's the only <laughs> that's the only joke about the the iconic theme song. I'll make uh, I'll I'll refrain to just that one joke, but I couldn't resist. Of course, the Criterion Collection has released a 4K UHD and Blu-ray combo pack of the iconic 1971 film Shaft, which is the first of the initial trilogy of films based on the Ernest Tidyman original novels featuring the character. Uh, this film is. You know, to, to say it is iconic, it is really the one of the films that defines the term iconic, uh, known as being one of the immortal films that opened the black exploitation genre uh, when that wasn't even uh, really a consideration in people's minds before that, that, that term was really coined, uh, coming off the heels of films like Cotton Comes to Harlem and Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song. Uh, this being also from MGM and being a wide national release for all audiences proved to not only be very successful, but having an iconic black character be uh, completely his own man in a feature film that is very obviously patterned on uh, a lot of classic genres, particularly private eye films, uh, and being uh, not subservient to anyone in any way, shape, or form helped to sort of establish a new screen uh, version of not just black culture, but masculinity. And uh, it, 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 it's, it's one of those times where you have a so-called commercial product that's actually operating on uh, philosophical means too, because as Gordon Parks says in some of the interviews, uh, talking about his photography career, that he could achieve more with a camera than uh, you know a, a dozen men with guns ever could. Uh, so the idea of promoting a, a a black hero in John Shaft in the way that the films do is that uh, you're you're able to get across ideas of equality within a so-called commercial product that's meant to simply be an entertainment. Uh, this this is something that you get in in pretty much all black exploitation films, whether they're good films or bad films or not, and and it's it's part of why they're so incredibly important. Uh, it's unfortunate that the the term was coined and now and it's usually uh, used as a, a negative label. The the negativity I think comes from studios and other entities suddenly realizing yes there was this market they they could now exploit and of course MGM was not doing very well at this point in 1971 so they needed this film to be a hit and uh, you know very much banked on that and it was enormously successful but it was the success of films like this that caused a lot of other people to say hey Here's an untapped market. Let's let's uh, dig into this. And the the problem then became that they 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 were trying to exploit said market. So the name is befitting of most of the films that came out in the wake of the early so-called black exploitation films. But uh, you you it's very obvious that you know which ones have more intelligence behind them and which ones are simply meant to be entertainments and which ones are, of course, simply exploitative. Uh, but this film it remains a, a true standout because it, it achieves and sort of ticks off multiple iconic boxes. Uh, it, it's also from the sort of watershed year of 1971 where you had a multitude of films come out that dealt with darker and grittier subject matter, uh, and it, it, Shaft sort of stands alongside several other films from the same year that deal with a singular masculine hero character navigating through the world of 1971, whether it be a city or not. Uh, the, the also sort of emerging darkness, it, 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 it very much is in keeping with these other films. Uh, so you could look at Shaft, and on this particular rewatch, I was really struck at how you could look at Shaft as sort of a reflection of what you see in Dirty Harry. They have some similar themes, uh, but of course, John Shaft and Harry Callahan go along things entirely differently. And of course, you have New York versus San Francisco. But both films do make the city and location a real life place. And so they become a time capsule for that particular city. Uh, talking about that particular aspect, 
you also see Shaft and you can't help but immediately think of The French Connection, also from 1971. And also, rather interestingly, the uh, primary screenwriter and creator of the character, Ernest Tidyman, who wrote all six Shaft novels, which uh, I, I really do want to read uh, because apparently they're much darker and uh, much different to what we get in the films. Uh, he, of course, also wrote the screenplay for The French Connection. So uh, you, 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 it, it, there's a reason why Shaft feels so much like The French Connection. It's not just because it's one of the great New York films and shot at the same time pretty much came out in the same year it's because you know they, they share the same screenwriter so of course they're gonna have some similarities and and, and have some shared dna because of that uh, but that makes it an interesting parallel because there is inherent uh, racism in popeye doyle's character in the french connection and you see how the police are depicted in navigating through all areas of new york and through all the different uh, aspects of culture within the city in 1971 well they don't quite get into as much of the areas that John Shaft winds up navigating throughout the film. So there's an interesting sort of parallel between the two, and they make a great double feature uh, because you're essentially getting sides of the city and Shaft that you don't get in the French Connection and vice versa, so they make nice companion pieces. But if you ever wondered why uh, Shaft feels so so much like the French Connection, uh, you know, not that it's... You know, obviously, William Friedkin has his own particular, very identifiable style, and so does Gordon Parks, and they're polar opposites. The The fact that if they are two of the most iconic New York films and feature singular masculine characters navigating through the, the depths of darkness in the city, it's, it's not just the setting and locale that makes them uh, have shared DNA. They have the same screenwriter. Uh, but the other film that it also makes you think of from 1971 which again also can you can link to Dirty Harry is of course the iconic Get Carter, which is almost in some ways almost riffing on some of the same ideas and even some of the same structure from a private detective or in Get Carter's case a gangster film. Uh, and while you can make connections between Shaft and Dirty Harry, well I think you can also make them with Get Carter, but of course in a in a way that manages to take the stylization of Dirty Harry with the stylization of Shaft and also, you know, to put them into an entirely British perspective in Newcastle, but also get Carter adds even more. Uh, there's there's a slight tinge of dark humor in both Dirty Harry and Shaft, but get Carter really minds that, and that's what that's what helps to make that film so unique and so special. But I think it's fascinating to look at all three of these films with iconic lead actor performances in them, uh, all extraordinarily strong. Uh, d- characters who are you know when pushed nasty pieces of work uh, and and capable of uh, dealing out extreme violence and they all come out at the same time and they're all reflective of the people who made them the places there the the locations they were set in and the countries they were made in you know they they give a sort of slice i guess of the uh, the sort of experience of each of those worlds if you want to call them that Uh, so i just thought it was fascinating this time thinking about not just the sort of what's termed the black exploitation films, but the other films of 1971. So there's many connections you could make, but I think it's fascinating to look at how Shaft works uh, in a sort of, again, it's working within the sort of traditional confines of a private eye movie in terms of the story structure. But of course, it's talking about and dealing with the black experience and being set in New York and being shot on real locations and using... You know, pretty much no studio interiors for the most part, and it's got that wonderful '70s low-budget, gritty feel to it. It's it's got a that that wonderful time capsule sense. So it's one of the great New York films alongside The French Connection. Uh, it's a New York that no longer exists, but it's it's such a, a particular place and time that's amazing. We have this document, and of course, this means that the film itself. On a technical note, you know, it's it's going to be very rough around the edges. They didn't have a large budget. Uh, it is shot in a very, 
Yeah, I mean, you, you could call it in some ways a documentary style. Gordon Parks had been a uh, photographer for many years, well-renowned, working for the various uh, federal projects and for the government, and then he turned to making documentaries. So he did have a documentary background, uh, just as Mike Hodges did, actually, uh, before he made Get Carter. Uh, so there's another sort of shared similarity there. But uh, Parks, I think, was was adamant, and, and rightly so, about making sure to convey the world experience of, of, of the, the, the world that John Shaft is having to navigate. And so that the, in turn explains the way he carries himself, why he uh, dresses the way that he does. Uh, it's all a personal expression of self, whether it really matters to anyone else or not. It's, you know, it's just who he is and what he's going to do. And that he is not in any case any way, shape, or form have any uh, part of his self-expression or his character be be denied or, um, or or subjugated in any way, which of course leads to <laughs> the the opening sequence, which is the most iconic and uh, famous part of the film, with of course the uh, the immortal Isaac Hayes theme which is the perfect musical accompaniment to Shaft's character uh, because it, it uh, perfectly renders who this guy is uh, almost to the point of the music itself matches uh, the, the, the actual walk, the stride that Richard Roundtree has as he's prowling around Times Square. The, the music coils and unfurls like a, like a cat stalking around uh, on, on its home turf. That's the sort of sense you're getting. But uh, th this makes John Shaft literally the, the coolest badass you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> I mean, it just it, it, it permeates off the screen and it just knocks you over. Uh, so this is a film that anyone can see. I, I of course, saw it many times growing up uh, because it was just a, a, a wonderful very atmospheric, gritty experience. And even as a kid, I loved seeing the, the sort of classic New York films of the 70s to, that, that, that really drive home that, that sort of, you know, the, the urban decay that is so famously uh, monologued on and on about by Travis Pickle and Taxi Driver. Well, you get to see it as is essentially here in Shaft. And so it is a, one of the great New York films and, and a, a true time capsule because of that. But when you look at it in terms of the actual filmmaking and the actual uh, technical side, it obviously is a lower budgeted film that MGM did finance. But they didn't have all the money in the world and they used everything they had at their disposal. Uh, so you get that wonderful sort of slight documentary feel, but also you can tell it's not, a, it's, you know, it's not a gigantic crew working in this on this film. Uh, they had limited means, so they're making every dollar count. And uh, the usage of practical locations everywhere throughout New York does really sell the atmosphere of the you are there feeling. It's something that uh, they they did try to carry on in the sequel, but the sequel is quite a bit more polished. So you you never get this sense again. This this sort of pure uh, you know uh, feeling. A shaft could turn a corner walking down the street, and you feel like you are actually there in a back alley or something. Uh, in terms of the story and the plot, it is based on uh, Tidy Men's original novel. Uh, again, I have never gotten the chance to read his original books. He apparently wrote six novels, only which only which really two were used uh, for for the films. But apparently, uh, the, the Shaft character in the novels is actually quite a bit darker. We get more of his backstory. He was essentially a, an even tougher character. Uh, it was a Vietnam veteran and had essentially come back from the war and was, was dealing with a lot of uh, personal turmoil and trying to not only readjust, but also... Uh, live and make a make a living as a private eye uh so apparently there's there's a lot more grittiness that even than what you see in the film in the novels and again there are six of them and unfortunately they've been out of print for many decades so um i've i've wanted to read them before but uh, i i now really want to make a conscious effort to try and find them uh, i just never knew that they were so distinctly different uh, apparently there's there's a lot more character and backstory in them and they are quite dark <laughs> and they apparently are even darker than what you get in the films. Uh, of course, the film was incredibly successful uh, and is really remembered most, of course, for the iconic Isaac Hayes score and Richard Roundtree's just 
iconic lead performance that really made him an icon overnight, uh, which is even more astounding because this was really his first major starring role in a feature film. And there's no sense of, oh, this is a young actor really wanting to, to make his mark in terms of being nervous on screen or anything. There's none of that. <laughs> there's absolutely none. And I think that is, um, al along with the establishing the sort of documentary sense and really getting across the feel of who this character is and, and what this world is he's moving through. I think the the other great contribution that Gordon Parks brought to Shaft was having an innate sense of who Shaft had to be as a screen character to really be larger than life and mythic in all kinds of ways, but still be grounded in human like a traditional a private detective from hard-boiled fiction. Uh, so having to balance that, having the elements of fantasy sort of creep in to, to make him a larger-than-life character, to really bowl audiences over, uh, that, that, that's what helps along with the other things I mentioned. It's, it's these elements that make Shaft iconic because when you look at the story, it's actually quite simple. This is one of those films where, while there's a little bit of a mystery aspect to it, uh, when, when you look at the plot and it, it, as a separate entity, uh, separate from the whole film experience, it, it boils down to something that's, that's very simple. Essentially, the, what sets the plot in motion is the chief kingpin uh, criminal character of Bumpy uh, has had his, uh, his daughter has been kidnapped uh, ostensibly by the mafia. And so he wants to hire John Shaft to track her down and get her back unharmed. Uh, that's the the whole plot set up in a nutshell. It's it's very simple, but of course there are some double crosses and things. But it's it's not a very you know it's no it's not a very labyrinth mystery. It's not a very complicated plot. It's still you know grounded in what what you'd see in a novel. And of course this is based on Tidyman's original novel, I believe. Uh, so it's it's not a very convoluted narrative. So this is. A film that is much more about the experience as a whole, and when you combine the the very documentary influenced uh, elements that Gordon Parks is focusing on, and try, trying to really set and maintain a feel throughout the film, uh, once once you get to those opening titles, that that never lets up because if it did, uh, it would be it, 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 it would not go very well because the plot is very simple. And, and so that's why most of the film's iconic stature rests on the more uh, filmic qualities of, of the experience. It's about the experience. It's about, that's why everybody always talks about the score and how uh, John Shaft is as a heroic, larger-than-life character. And, and they talk about the, the accoutrements. They talk about how John Shaft dresses and how iconic the turtlenecks and the leather, ja the leather jackets and trench coats are, which, of course, they are. <laughs> Even though I could not pull any of those off, I'd still look like a total, total nerd. Um, of course, one would try anyway. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it, it's it's a film that is defined by the overall experience of placing you within a very gritty universe that still has, you know, some elements of fantasy mixed in there. And apparently this was a sort of uh, point of contention between Tidyman and Parks, that uh, Tidyman would have preferred it to be a much more gritty and straight-ahead story, uh, basically just like his novels were, whereas Gordon Parks knew that this was a movie meant for commercial enjoyment and wanted to to focus on that and where, po where really wherever possible bring in other elements of black culture whether that be in the uh, in, in the production design or the costuming or especially the music which of course is how you, you get to Isaac Hayes and uh, coming in to do not just the theme song but the entirety of the score itself. Uh, so it's actually unfortunate in a way that nowadays pretty much all you hear about is the score uh, and the iconic and groundbreaking uh, status of the film, but most people don't actually talk about the film itself, which is rather solid, and you do have to always keep in mind just how little money they had, and, you know, it does... 
if, if you look at it closely, it does show that they didn't really have a lot of money, but because they are using all practical locations and they are in New York in 1971 shooting this, I mean, right there in the opening titles when Shaft is going around Times Square, and one of the one of the really the first close shot, you see Richard Roundtree standing there looking unbelievably cool. And of course, his breath is just creating this huge fog because it must be freezing. <laughs> and so you get that you get the the wonderful iconic swagger of the opening titles. But, you know, when you look at it, it looks like a pretty miserable place. You can see how freezing cold it is. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and of course it continues, but you're right there from that moment in the opening titles, you know that we're still in a particular place in time, and this is st this still has grittiness to it. And so the fact that it is a low budget production, and you know the the the, the, the sound mix is mono, and it's not very you know polished, and you you can tell when they're in a, a, a real location, and they're just having to rig lights up and and try to work with what they have. It, it makes you appreciate it all the more when you look at it from, uh, you know, an actual filmmaking perspective. But when you're watching the film, you're not really thinking about this because the illusion is so total uh, because, you know, they're actually there in real locations. There's no sense of artifice in that way. And uh, again, that's something that really helps uh, make this so iconic and such an experience because you have that sort of you are there feeling. When you get to the, the first sequel, where most of the same production team comes back, because it is more polished, you do lose quite a bit of that. So uh, the, the first sequel, Shaft's Big Score, actually does feel a little bit more, I mean, not studio-bound, because it's still mostly practical locations, but it doesn't have that sort of iconic status. It doesn't have the same flavor as the original film, which is why it stands apart on, on its own so much. And quite frequently, people don't even talk about, let alone even know or are aware of, there are two sequels that were made by MGM in the 70s. So uh, that's that's why I wanted to also talk about those as well, because they are frequently overlooked. And uh, really, if you come to Shaft, you really do have to look at the two sequels, because uh, not a lot of black exploitation films actually did get sequels, you know, films in this sort of genre. Some did, uh, but... Usually they didn't get two of them and with a, with very different approaches to each of them, actually, uh, and also being produced by a major studio in MGM as well. So uh, it's, it's an interesting case, and so it forms a sort of trilogy of films that I think are, are fascinating, and I've sort of grown up with them. Uh, the sequels are much more obscure, so it, it, I didn't see them for a good number of years until I was much older, and I suddenly discovered there were sequels, which I, were, which I wasn't aware of, uh, again, because they've just been more obscure. So again, it's, it's rare to actually encounter people who know them, and then if, 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 they, if they do, uh, because they're actually good, uh, which which you wouldn't think they would be, but they are. Uh, they're 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 very underrated. So those of us who've actually seen them, when we actually get to talk about them, it's kind of it's it's a pleasant surprise because you don't get to really talk about the Shaft sequels. That's why I, it was it was so wonderful to see the original film get a brand new 4K scan because. On video, it hasn't been handled the best uh, because of the very grungy nature of the original photography and shoot. It's a very dark film uh, in terms of a lot of, there's a lot of nighttime shooting, there's a lot of practical light usage. It's not an easy film to transfer, and the, the older transfers were really getting on up there in age, and it had never gotten a big special edition with a lot of extras or anything. Uh, so that's why it was wonderful to hear that it was going to get the deluxe treatment plus a 4k uhd from criterion so talk about the overall picture quality and presentation of the original film on the criterion release this is a brand new 4k scan uh, with a dolby vision grade on the uhd disc and then the blu-ray has a 1080p sdr uh, down conversion of the uh, brand new 4k master so you get the new restoration master on both presentations if uh, depending on what your system is or if you're not uh, a 4k equipped yet you can purchase this release and future proof yourself because it's all a in a dual format release as criterion has been doing uh the new master is really spectacular they they have really done an incredibly fine job at 
really getting this film across on video. And all you have to do is pop on the old Warner Blu-ray for two seconds before, uh, before after seeing this new transfer, even if you're just looking at the Blu-ray, because that will show you how the film used to be handled. And that that's a pretty old master. And then, of course, if you want to jump back to the DVD, which is from the Snapper Case era, uh, that's actually, I think it's even the old Laserdisc Master, which was a late release LD. Uh, and it's a flipper disc with a open matted presentation on the other side. Um, but uh, the old releases are, br- uh, they definitely have some brightness boosting going on. Uh, so while this transfer may look darker on the surface, that's really how it's supposed to look. If you've ever seen a film from this era shot in this way, uh, from a print actually projected, that is very apparent. If you've ever gotten the chance to see Shaft or The French Connection in a theater, uh, you know it's it, it's definitely something. So until the modern uh, restorations and scans, none of the video versions were as dark as they should be. Uh, so you are going to see a lot of moments in this film that are extremely dark, where you can't even see uh, people's faces entirely, uh, even in daylight. But that really is tied more to the original photography of the film and how it is working from a sort of documentary background. So it's really intended to kind of look that way. And we've never uh, on video been able to see it as intended or, or the way it was shot. So if if you thought that, you know, that if, you, if you put this in and you think that it's a bit dark, that's because it doesn't have the sort of brightness boosting of the older releases. Uh, it is uh, also... The, the Blu-ray is handled fine in terms of encoding. It, 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 the Criterion does have a lot of issues with their Blu-ray encoding. Uh, some are worse than others. There aren't any major problems in terms of uh, macro blocking or anything that I noticed in the film transfer. So I think the Blu-ray looks fine and also looks better than the Warner disc. But when you jump over to the UHD, if you have the ability to play 4K disc, the actual enhancements are not just resolution and the Dolby Vision grading in terms of HDR, but you have so much more uh, breathing room for for the transfer and you're getting the the resolution bump and the wonderful Dolby Vision grading that just in, it, it just enhances uh, what this master has to give. And so I think this is one of those cases, especially for these Criterion dual format releases, that if you have the ability to play 4K uh, titles, this is definitely one where the 4K is a dramatic leap forward. Uh, it's not in terms of overall, oh my gosh, there's so much more detail because the resolution is so much greater. This is so much more across the board. This is a very grainy film, so you're, you're, you need to expect to see a lot of film grain. But it is more refined here on the UHD as compared to the Criterion Blu-ray. So it it would be better if Criterion Blu-rays were, you know, better encoded. It wouldn't be as as big of a difference, I would say. But here, I think the Dolby Vision grading on top of it being in 4K just adds that extra layer of immersion. And so I have never seen this film look this good. Uh, I've seen it on practically every format. Matt. I grew up seeing it on television uh, or on cable, and so you know it, it was it was fun uh, when I first got the DVD and I first saw it in widescreen. Uh, because of course this is 185, so I was used to seeing it opened up to 133. Uh, so, but seeing it this way, um, it's it's definitely a, a stunner of a disc visually. Uh, and you will notice a difference if you compare to the Blu-ray, if you have the ability to, uh, if you're watching the 4K disc and you pop in the Blu-ray, which I do strongly advise you to check it out just to see the difference on your own setup. Uh, they, they will look, of course, very similar because it's the same master, but uh, you will notice the overall look uh, when you pop in the Blu-ray to do a direct comparison. It just has a, a much it has a much lesser feel because uh, it, it doesn't have the you know it's of course SDR so you don't have the Dolby Vision grading you don't have the uh, the greater breathing room for the transfer and of course you're down resting to 1080p but then you're also uh, compressing down further because they also have all the extras on the disc as well and they're not always great encoding either so. 
there are some trade-offs. Um, I do think this is a great release to pick up if you don't have 4K capability yet, because the Blu-ray is that much of an improvement due to this new master, and the new extras are great. Uh, but I do think the UHD is a big jump forward across the board in all areas uh, in terms of color, contrast, clarity, the the resolution of the green structure. Uh, it, it feels much more nuanced visually. Um, and it does make uh, the, the, the restoration work really stand out because all the, this is a really wonderful job. I only noticed a handful of spots uh, where uh, there, I, I saw a stray uh, fleck or, or, or mark or maybe a spot of dirt or two, and they were extraordinarily fleeting. Uh, so much so that uh, it's, it's one of those transfers that you see where it's a beautiful restoration that, and when you see a spot of dirt somewhere, a real tiny one, then it makes you stop and really notice it because that's like the only one you've seen in 45 minutes, you know? So there's like, you know, maybe four or five very fleeting spots where there's like a stray mark or two and that's it. Um, it it's a really beautiful looking master. And I, I think on a, on a technical note in terms of, um, in terms of their UHD releases, it's probably the best UHD criterion put out in 2022. Uh, so if you love 70s films, if you love the gritty films of the era, if you love New York films, and if you love Shaft, which you should, this is a, an obvious must-own, no-brainer title, even if you're still uh, only able to be, view the Blu-ray for now, because the Blu-ray is still excellent, it's just not up to what the UHD can do. I should also mention that there are some spots in the film, as the restoration notes credit, they were using the original negative, but there are some spots that had deteriorated, so they had to go back to color separation masters. And really, the whole film looks great, but there's, of course, one section that if you know this film, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about before I say it. It's always looked really bad. <laughs> That's, of course, the cafe scene where Shaft has his espresso while he's waiting for the mob contact to uh, lead him to the meeting to try and rescue the kidnapped girl. Uh, it, it's very soft, and it doesn't look very good at all, and it sticks out like a sore thumb. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's always been that way. Uh, I've never seen an original release print, but I don't know if it was just uh, due to the way that that scene was shot that day or if something got damaged in the lab. I'm not sure, but I assume that's the, the, the section they're talking about, that they had to go to other elements and, and sort of redo it from scratch. There might be one or two other spots where they did that, but uh, that one cafe scene is always the one that, that looks really dodgy. Uh, it's the same way on the old Warner Blu-ray. It's the same way on the DVD. It's always looking looked bad this is the best i've ever seen it but do keep in mind uh, when that scene comes up it's just that's that's how that scene has always looked unfortunately now to talk about the audio we have two options here both lossless uh and their presentation and and pcm uh, this is uh, an interesting case where we do have the film's original mono mix but then there's also a stereo remix that really seems more about uh, adding the score from stereo stems. So it's not a full-on multi-channel remix and they're not changing the effects, but it is uh, focusing more on uh, creating a stereo experience from a sort of audiophile standpoint of taking a mono source and uh, turning it into stereo and trying to make it a true stereo thing by focusing on the music. This is something they used to do a lot in the Laserdisc era when they started the whole concept of audio remixes. So um, I, I appreciate it as as being there for as an option should you wish to view the film in a more stereo sound field. But uh, the the mono is really what, what what you should be focusing on and worried about because this was always a mono film, especially for 1971 and being a low budget. Um, it is a it, because it is a low budget, it, the the fidelity of the track has never been the greatest. You, it is pretty obvious that this was you know done as best as possible, but it does have, you know, some thinness, particularly in the in the upper high range. Uh, it does have some baked in bits of high end distortion, and it does sound rather thin in places uh, but if you, you've ever seen a film from this era that was mixed and released in mono and didn't have a gigantic budget you'll know what to expect it's not uncommon for films even of 1971 and so 
I, you know, that stereo is a nice option. I did sample it. I did look at it, but I, 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 as a purist, it's not something I would really ever watch the film in, but again, I appreciate it being here. But what's interesting is they, they do seem to have worked on the mono track because it is significantly better than what's on the old Warner Blu-ray, which seems to have been a, a tweaked version of what was on the DVD. Uh, so I do think the audio is actually quite improved in this release as well. It's still limited uh, due to the source materials and, and, and how the film was originally mixed. But, uh, you, you know, don't go into it expecting a modern, perfect, on a technical level sound experience. But... For, for what this track is and how it's sounded over the years, I really appreciated that you know somebody took the time to go in and tried to clean up the track without uh, getting super heavy-handed and noise reduction and things. Um, so I, I think the audio is actually just as impressive as the new picture transfer. Uh, and you do have the stereo remix option should you wish to, uh, to view the film that way. So you get that as a nice bonus as well. So to talk about the packaging and the overall appearance, this is in the traditional Criterion case. And as all their dual format editions, this is both formats in one case. The artwork is brand new for this release and I think really beautiful. I love the usage of purple. I love the overall design aesthetic. It definitely has the sort of shaft identity in terms of the feel of it. And even if you've never seen this film before, you see this artwork and it definitely gives you the feeling of the film perfectly. So I really love what they did with the artwork. I was so happy that... The artwork commissioned wasn't the sort of usual, very arty criterion approach because you know they're, they they could have done all kinds of different approaches for this. So um, I, if they're if you're not going to use original poster artwork, uh, this one I was really impressed by, and uh, the more I look at it, the more I I love it even more. So I really love this art, new art, and of course the purple background carries over onto the spine, which does feel very shaft esque. And then that carries over onto the rear with the usual Criterion layout. And then the interior has the same motif. We have more of the artwork for the fold-out booklet, the two Blu-rays on one side, and then you take the booklet out, and then we have the UHD disc on the left. This is a fold-out booklet, as Criterion usually does. So, of course, uh, to read the very nice essay, you do have to fold it out like so. Uh, I think we're all kind of used to this with Criterion booklets, but I, I will say, of course, it is, um, you know, it, it's it's a little awkward trying to read, but, you know, we're, we're kind of used to it by now, but it would be nice if they just switched to stapled books like, like most other labels, but, you know, I guess that's uh, a Criterion holdover because they've been doing it for years. Now, uh, one note I did want to mention now that I've got this open, it's no secret, but uh, not just Criterion, but a lot of labels are having problems with the disc manufacturing plants uh, in terms of, especially with UHDs, because, uh, you know, the players are so finicky, you know, if there's a speck of dust on them, they can have issues. Uh, but there's there's a lot of problems nowadays with discs having scuffs and scratches and things. Um, I've had some issues with some Criterion releases uh, along with other labels, and I'm not alone in this, but here... Uh, the UHD disc was fine, thankfully, uh, because that's the one that's more uh, prone to having issues if there's even a, a, a scuff or a speck on it. But unfortunately, the Blu-rays actually had a number of scuffs on them, uh, and pretty significant ones too. So I was I was happy when they they played back okay. But uh, this is uh, unfortunately something that's happening in disc manufacturing nowadays. So anytime you buy a new release, even if it's a brand new Criterion title, the first thing you need to do is get the plastic off and actually check the disc surfaces because um, th while these were still okay, it, it is uh, d d these the, the, the Blu-rays had such significant scuff marks on them that I was uh, actually doubtful they'd play back accurately. Um, one one wasn't too bad, but the actual disc for the the main feature, which of course has the, the bulk of the extras, did have uh, quite a number of scuffs on it. 
Um, unfortunately, you can't see them on camera, and it's nice that Blu-rays are, of course, scratch-resistant, so somebody definitely had to work hard to get a bunch of scuffs on there, but it was pretty significant. So, uh, again, I do I do want to warn people, don't just buy uh, Criterion titles and, and put them on the shelf. You do need to check them because, uh, again, a lot of labels and different releases are having problems because the manufacturing plants are you know overworked and they're, they're having some issues, some pretty major ones now with uh, discs getting scratched or scuffed up or uh, cases having the sort of oily substance inside on the actual plastic and things. But um, unfortunately, I've had a couple Criterion releases now that have uh, either messed up booklets or scratched discs and things. So uh, do always check, uh, check the discs when you get a new release. Unfortunately, with the extras overall, there's a problem that it rears its head up here and there. Uh, and this, again, goes back to Criterion's issues in more recent years with disc encoding. So while there's no major encoding problems with the feature transfer, uh, it could be better, but there's nothing you know, major or that, that sticks out really bad, like bad macro blocking or something. Unfortunately, in a lot of the Criterion produced extras, uh, I guess they just, you know, encoded them to, you know, fit more onto a disc or just made the bit rates really low. But it's it's very apparent you're going to see a lot of digital noise and compression artifacts in the background, uh, particularly in, in, in some more than others where the backgrounds are dark because some are in very light rooms where the person is talking. And there you don't really notice anything, but when it's a dark room especially, uh, you'll see all kinds of macro blocking and digital noise in the background. And also some some stuff on movement, because when somebody moves around, uh, you see some you know shifting uh, bits of digital noise and things. And that was really uh, noticeable, and it kept happening through a number of the, of the featurettes and extras. So... Unfortunately, you, you see this more and more uh, across all kinds of different labels in terms of uh, newly produced features and things where they just you know make, make, try to fit more on a disc or they just make the bit rate really low or they lower it for the extras. So uh, that's why I, I, you, you'll start seeing this more and more. So I, I've seen it on a number of releases now where there's some macro blocking or digital noise in the background of an extra because they've made, made the bit rate lower. Or if you have clips from the film, uh, even if it's the same new restored master, the quality is usually lesser, and sometimes it has the sort of noisy or frozen grain effect, which I've seen a couple times. Uh, here, it seems pretty much confined to when you have the people talking in a room and you just see a whole bunch of digital noise going on and macro blocking and stuff. And it's quite major. It's not just a little bit. It is very noticeable. And especially if you've been watching the 4K release and you're watching the extras discs on your uh, 4K television, you, it is very plainly obvious. It's rather painfully obvious. So that's why I wanted to mention it because you're going to notice it. It's very noticeable. Um, while I understand having to worry about uh, disc size limitations, uh, there there shouldn't be a reason to have all kinds of macro blocking and digital noise going on in in an extra that's uh, that's on the disc. You know, um, I, I don't know if they 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 could have moved more to the second Blu-ray disc with Shaft's big score, uh, or or maybe had a third disc. I don't know, but. Um, it, it, it's definitely unfortunate that uh, the special features are kind of marred by the disc encoding in that sense. So here, the disc encoding issues really are, unfortunately, uh, they're, they're, they're present and they're, much, they're, they're pretty much affecting the extras more than the actual feature transfer in terms of visible uh, artifacts and things. But it was very noticeable watching on a 4K television, so that's why I wanted to mention it, because I was very surprised to see that on a Criterion release. Now, to talk about the supplemental features package, this is a quite stuffed release. In fact, I think it's uh, one of Criterion's best uh, supplement packages overall in quite some time. However, uh, it does have some notable exclusions, which I, I was rather disappointed by. Uh, but overall, I, I think it's the best extras package they've done in some time because there's a lot of ground covered. And to go through all the extras, 
you know, there's quite a number of hours of additional materials on this release. So this isn't just a great new dual format release. You do get your money's worth from the extras. Uh, most of them do uh, focus on discussing the, the groundbreaking qualities of Shaft, its iconic nature. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about the score. So it, it, a lot of the, the talk may be um, some material that you've heard before, but it does go uh, deeper into the historical context and importance of the film and the background of the key cast and crew personnel. So uh, don't let that discourage you if, if at first you think, oh, well, I've heard this stuff before. And then there are other additional features that do go more in depth on certain aspects, which I was really pleased to see. So to go over these briefly, uh, we have the overall uh, new documentary about the film. And again, this is about its historical context and groundbreaking status and iconic nature. Uh, and it gets into all kinds of aspects about how this film played in 1971 and how it plays now in the 2020s. So there's a great amount of discussion in all the extras about this film and the and and how it is today in 2022 2023 as I'm recording this video and that will be really helpful and rewarding to those especially those who have never seen this film before and maybe seeing it for the first time in the Criterion release and there they, these pieces all have a number of really great critics and film scholars and uh, various uh, people and uh, contributing so much that they're not just the usual generic talking heads so that's really something that Criterion is, uh, you know, has, has led the charge in doing for some time. So it's no surprise that they produced uh, a really great uh, documentary piece on the film and its overall impact. Uh, then we have the vintage uh, filming shaft on location piece, which is part of the original promotion of the film. And that is uh, that was really usually the lone extra on old releases. Uh, then there are other vintage materials. Uh, there's a really interesting uh, interview that Isaac Hayes did on, I believe it's a French television program. Uh, it's in black and white, and it's obviously an old TV show, but it's fascinating seeing him talk about his career and the uh, scoring Shaft, uh, you know, shortly after the film had been released. And, uh, it's, you know, any surviving materials are fascinating. So that was a nice inclusion. Uh, but do keep in mind that is uh, a mixture of French and English with subtitles. Then there's a fascinating archival interview with Gordon Parks himself where he talks about his life, his career as a photographer, uh, his his upbringing, his sort of immersion into the film industry, and then making his first film, The Learning Tree, before then doing Shaft and and trying other avenues. Uh, it's it's a fascinating interview. It's really rewarding, and uh, you know I, I went in already knowing some of Parks's history, and uh, already had uh, great respect and admiration for for his work works and and uh, but but seeing this and always getting that uh, from the horse's mouth direct perspective from a person uh, it just enhances that that respect you have for um, for not only their work but now you have a sense of what their approach is and it's it's a wonderful thing uh, in terms of the interview itself and it's very candid and shot on film uh, you know so it definitely has a a vintage feel to it and also rather interesting interspersed throughout is all this footage of uh, being on a train uh, because Parks talks about one of, his, one of his first jobs was actually working on on a train and doing the long train journeys and uh, so that that's nicely interspersed throughout the interview to give you a real uh, sensory connection to to what uh, to the that part of his life that he's talking about um, so uh, in fact it's it's one of the best extras in the entire set even though it's just you know labeled as an archival interview and it's it runs about 20 minutes so it's it's lengthy enough but it's it's most rewarding for getting a sense of the man himself and his approach to not just making the shaft films but just to our Art in general and that uh, everything he did actually did have meaning behind it and then that was the whole point because he says you know otherwise then but what is the point to, you know if, if you're doing this stuff and there's no reason for it then what's the point of even doing it in the first place uh, so that that is a really welcome and rewarding inclusion 
There's also uh, two pieces with Richard Roundtree. There's a more modern interview where he talks about uh, this being his major breakthrough film role and how he was very young and, and, and very nervous about pulling it off, uh, but also what, what the film has meant to him and what the legacy has meant for his career and looking back on it all these years later. So it's nice that we get uh, modern participation from the iconic Richard Roundtree. Uh, but also included is a really fascinating behind the scenes piece shot by a documentary crew uh, while they were setting up part of the action climax of the sequel, Shaft's Big Score. So you do get some on-set footage in the uh, for the sequel. Uh, you get some on-set footage in the vintage piece on the original film, but this one is, I don't think it's ever been put on a video release before, so it was a really nice inclusion because you get to see the film crew at work and you get to see them having a little bit more money to play around with as they're working on the sequel. There's a new documentary on Isaac Hayes' score and the composition of the score and his collaboration with Gordon Parks. There is a brand new interview with the film's costume designer which is really wonderful because he's getting to look back at this point in his career and also uh, it's it's rather humorous because he's talking constantly about how they had no money <laughs> and how they were how he's having to struggle to 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 figure out how to do all these things and 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 get across what Gordon Parks wanted with not much money <laughs> So I, I really enjoyed that um, because it, it, getting that uh, first-person perspective from someone who has not uh, not been quoted very often. So that, that was really rewarding. Then in a really great touch, there's a new uh, entire documentary piece on the black detective in fiction and pop culture, uh, which, of course, talks a little bit about the Shaft novels and the films, but also all the other characters that sort of exploded out of Pulp Fiction and sort of created a, a, its own literary subgenre slightly before the black exploitation movement really took off in the film world. So it's a fascinating look at the sort of basis for a lot of these films that started coming out, uh, but they, they, the, this material was starting to erupt in literature and become popular, and publishers realized they could sell books on subjects like this. So it turned into a whole thing before black exploitation films really took off. And this is a material that you just don't see covered anywhere. Uh, so that's one again, another of the most fascinating extras in, in the entire set, and it goes on at length that a lot, about a lot of the uh, various characters and authors and how they sort of in turn influenced one and then the other would be influenced by another. They just started carrying on until you get to uh, Ernest Tidyman writing the first Shaft novel. Uh, then in probably the best overall extra in the set, we have an entire Shaft retrospective documentary by the great Constantine Nasser, who is you know, a, pretty much a legend in terms of home video extras. You say uh, Constantine Nasser in terms of documentary or commentary or featurette, and you know you, you've hit that sort of gold standard of uh, home video extras and uh, film history reporting. And this is a rather lengthy 45-minute documentary in several parts that has uh, participation from Richard Roundtree and Samuel L. Jackson and so many other people. Um, I'm thinking maybe they, they, they made this around the time of the 2019 Shaft film or something. Uh, but this goes into a discussion of the character overall, the legacy of the character in the, the films and the novels. There's great discussion of the novels and uh, their their literary significance and their difference uh, the, uh, compared to the films. And also there is some discussion about the sequels and the 2000 relaunch film which was really great because outside of this there's not really much if any mention of the two sequels in any of the extras otherwise so uh, this is the best comprehensive extra in the set so if you start anywhere you should start with this documentary uh, because it, it is uh, really comprehensive about not just the films but the whole notion of John Shaft as a character from the novels all the way up unto the present then we have two trailers included for the original film and the uh, for the first sequel Shaft's Big Score uh, unfortunately they're both standard def so they weren't rescanned so they look pretty much the same as what they did on uh, the old uh, Warner Blu-ray of the original film uh, we also get a radio spot which is uh, similarly advertised and always great fun to have radio spots carry over and then of course we have the booklet essay as well 
Now, there is one more very notable extra that I saved for last because uh, Criterion has actually included the first sequel, Shaft's Big Score, from 1972, which was also directed by Gordon Parks and most of the same key personnel returning alongside Richard Roundtree. So this is the second of the so-called Shaft trilogy. Unfortunately, for some reason, it was determined to not include the third film, Shaft in Africa, so uh, they, they could have made a Shaft trilogy set like Warner Archive did, but uh, opted not to for some reason. Uh, so this is on included on Blu-ray Disc 2, along with the, the other extras they are not on Disc 1. And uh, this is the same master that Warner Archive prepared from a new scan for their Blu-ray release. So if you have the Warner Archive set, this is exactly the same transfer. But the issue is with Criterion and their uh, their encoding problems, uh, you, you can't compare the same master on a Criterion disc to a Warner Archive disc and expect them to be the same because Warner Archive always maxes out their bit rate and you know pretty much has the best uh, encoding of any U.S. label, period, on all of their releases. So this is a case where even a, a, a well-encoded looking Criterion disc of the same master does not look as good as the Warner Archive disc. Uh, so it is a bit of a downgrade in terms of the visual quality, even though the master is the same. Most people are probably not going to notice this because it's the same master and they'll just say, oh, well, it looks the same. But if you do have both discs, you can compare them directly. And if you watch either one for a couple minutes, you can sort of tell very quickly which one is is definitely the stronger encoded and of course has the much bigger bit rate as well so it's unfortunate that they they couldn't just literally copy uh you know what warner archive did in terms of just literally take their disc and just put some extras on it um or and make some sort of deal it would have been amazing to do that for the whole trilogy so we could finally have one release with all three films but as it stands you do need to hang on to the Warner Archive release for not just the third film, which is uh, very underrated, uh, but having the slightly better picture quality for the uh, for the first sequel. The audio is the original mono mix. Uh, interestingly, on the Warner Archive, it's DTS HDMA lossless mono, whereas here it's the usual criterion uh, opting for a, a standard single channel mono in PCM. It's the same uh, audio from the same Warner Archive master. It's just you're getting it in a different presentation and codec. So um, if you prefer single channel and you like PCM, you, you get that benefit. But otherwise, the inclusion of Shaspic score is basically a slightly lesser encode of the Warner Archive disc. So it's unfortunate that's that's happened because I was I was very pleased that they included the first sequel in this release so at least got some representation of the other films but unfortunately it's just not as good as the Warner Archive disc and so it kind of makes its inclusion a little pointless especially if you're like me and you already have the Warner Archive set so um, you do definitely want to have the Warner Archive disc for uh, both Shaft's Big Score and Shaft in Africa. So those are my overall thoughts on the Criterion release of Shaft on both 4K UHD and Blu-ray, uh, which also includes the film's first sequel, Shaft's Big Score, also directed by Gordon Parks and starring Richard Roundtree. I do think this is one of the strongest Criterion releases in a long while. I think the UHD presentation is a knockout and finally gets this film looking and also sounding the way that it always should have on video. Um, I think you get all the benefits of what 4K and HDR can do. Uh, I think the Dolby Vision enhancement really does assist in the, the strengths of this presentation. And I do think this is definitely one of those releases where the UHD, while the improvements may be more on the subtle side, they are very evident even compared to the same master on the SDR Blu-ray. This combined with the fact that uh, Criterion has produced uh, some really beautiful artwork and uh, one of their most stuffed supplemental sections in quite some time. I think this is one of the uh, no-brainer Criterion releases to pick up, even if you're future-proofing yourself if you can't play UHD discs yet. Uh, I think the improvements on both in both SDR and HDR for this film, uh, if you own the old Warner disc in terms of the old Warner Blu-ray, I think the improvements are such that you will notice them from the opening titles and and just be like, nope, I don't <laughs> I don't need to ever watch the the Warner Blu-ray again. Uh, it wipes the floor with 
every prior video release. Uh, again, these supplements are extremely extensive and cover all kinds of ground and really uh, give you a crash course in the world of the production of this film, the legacy of John Shaft as a character, and of a lot of the key pr crew and team members who made this film uh, the iconic treasure that it is. And I think it will enhance your appreciation of the film overall, even if uh, you were only maybe a passing fan of it before, or you haven't seen it in a long time, or if you haven't seen it at all, uh, now is the perfect time to to finally correct that with the Criterion release. Uh, I, I do wish, though, uh, in terms of some shortcomings, I do wish Criterion's disc encoding was a bit better. Um, and I, if, if they were going to include the first sequel, I wish they would have included Shaft in Africa as well. Um, I also would have loved to have some ex specific extra about the sequels discussing them because they are very different and distinct from the original, uh, particularly Shaft in Africa, which has such a a, a, a very seemingly black exploitation title that you wouldn't think ever that it was a good film, but you actually see it and you're very surprised by the fact that it's actually not terrible and actually pretty good. Um, and, but in a much more fun, very action film oriented way with almost a James Bond type structure. So it's a very different thing uh, to the first two films. And of course, Gordon Parks did not direct the third film. So I think their idea was to just have the two films directed by Gordon Parks, which I can understand, but it would have been nice to have a whole trilogy set with new extras and everything. Um, it was nice of them to at least include the first sequel. They didn't have to do that, but if they were going to, it would have been great to just have it at least as good as the transfer specs on the Warner Archive disc because it, it, it sucks that Criterion discs are not always the best at encoding. Um, there's not any major problems here, but uh, when you watch the two versions of Shaft's Big Score, the two different releases, and you just compare them very directly, you can even see visually in some spots that there is a, a difference simply because the encoding isn't as good as uh, what Warner Archive put out. So... If you already have the Warner Archive disc, you're just buying this for the new extras and the beautiful new 4K master of the original film, and you just aren't you really going to pay much attention that it's got another copy of the first sequel on there. Uh, if you're buying this because you're also interested in the sequel, it's still a great presentation. It's derived from Warner Archive's master, but um, if you want slightly better quality plus the uh, rather underrated uh, second sequel, you can get the lovely Warner Archive uh, triple feature set, which includes both this plus the original Warner Brothers studio disc of Shaft. And there is another thing about that disc that actually is kind of important because the, the main extra they did include here was the first episode of the Shaft television series, also starring Richard Roundtree. Um, uh, that was a short-lived attempt at bringing Shaft to television after MGM decided they didn't want to make a, a fourth film. It doesn't really work, and it's very bizarre to see John Shaft suddenly on television, and the whole atmosphere is very much tamed down because it's suddenly a 70s television show, and obviously you didn't have the same freedom to uh, tackle subject matter as you did in films, so... It's, it's kind of a strange experience. I've never seen the whole series, uh, but it's nice that you can actually look at an episode here. And uh, the whole show has been uh, released to DVD by Warner Archive. So if you're interested, uh, you can pick up uh, an MOD release from them. And um, I actually need to do that because I've wanted to see the other episodes. I've just seen the, the one that's here on the Blu-ray. But uh, this is very affordable, so I do highly recommend uh, getting this in addition to the Criterion release. Uh, it'll give you the underrated third film, so you have the whole trilogy, the slightly better encoded second film, and of course, you get the original disc for the first film to look at Warner's now super outdated transfer, and uh, if you're curious, you can look at that episode of the TV series. Lastly, I'd like to say it's, it's a little surprising for such a stuff release that there is no commentary track. I really would have loved to have had a commentary track for Shaft, and also for Chef's Big Score as well, that would have been nice. Um, since you get so many extras, I guess it was it was felt maybe not necessary to do that. And I can understand that because there are hours of additional features and it will take you probably several different viewings to get through all of them. So you do get your money's worth in terms of supplements, but I, I do really miss having a commentary and Criterion seems to more and more uh, not do commentaries as often. So... 
you know, commentary is great when you can get them. Uh, and of course, you really want somebody who's invested. So you want a good commentary, not just a commentary for the sake of having a commentary track. But uh, I, I really do wish there had been a good commentary for this release because I think it would have just helped just sort of tie all the other extras together and a lot of times you can go into even more details in a commentary track than you can uh, just being an interviewee in a future ed but in any case um th those would be my only uh sort of minor uh minor points uh, of, of contention or, or things that I, I i wish had been done a little bit differently or if if i had the ability to sort of influence this release i would have liked to have seen uh you know a, something about the sequels and having a better on code of of the the blu-ray discs and and maybe see about getting shaft in africa in there as well and then also uh would have been lovely to have a commentary track but uh, in any case with those uh, sort of uh small uh minor quibbles aside this is one of the label's best releases of 2022 um of their uhd releases overall uh, for 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 the year it, it probably is their best one actually and that's saying something uh, because there are even more supplements than what you get on uh, double indemnity or um, I don't know the runtime of the extras but it feels even a bit even more stuff than their uh, UHD of Raging Bull uh, and the new master for, for Shaft is absolutely beautiful so don't hesitate to pick this up even if you're still uh, stuck watching Blu-rays only you'll still get the lovely benefit of the new master uh, it's a beautiful release overall. Uh, I never thought this film would get such deluxe treatment on disc because uh, Warner's studio label has never given it that that sort of prominence that it really deserves. And so it's great to finally have that corrected and it gets the full deluxe treatment from Criterion, who has done a really, uh, really impressive job uh, with some minor quibbles. But um, I, I was really impressed overall by the entirety of the release and all the extras and the beautiful artwork. So as always, I hope it's been at least somewhat fun to hear me once again babble on about classic films and physical media releases. Uh, if you have any thoughts or comments about the film and the Criterion release or what you thought about the overall Criterion package, I would love to hear them in the comments below. And as always, do keep supporting both uh, studio labels and boutique labels by buying films on disc to help keep physical media and film culture alive. And thank you ever so much for watching.